telling someone that every week when I look at the next uh, topic, as I've laid them all out, the topics that you have given for preaching, I kind of look at it like I'm a student, you know, given an assignment, you know, go, go, go preach on this. <laughs> and uh, I have to preach on the things that I've been assigned. And it's uh, very challenging sometimes to know how to address some of these things that maybe are not your, your topics that you traffic in every day. I'm very thankful for the opportunity. It's, uh, I really do in, enjoy it, though. Sometimes I, I find myself kind of um, challenged. But uh, the topic this week, we're, we're moving into a new category, and it's one that I, I just organize these in categories because it just helps maybe to give it a little bit of continuity or whatever. But uh, this one is on the category of Christian living, and we're just starting that category today. I have 13 different things, that, suggestions that you have given that are in this area. And there were so many in Christian living that I have another one that we're going to do later called Christian Living in the Home. <laughs> and it has quite a few other ones. So uh, these are Christian Living kind of in general, and the other ones will be Christian Living in the Home. Uh, the, the topic this week is a piety versus pietism. Now, we need to think about this. Piety and pietism, what, what are they? There are a lot of ways, of course, that this subject could be addressed because whenever you have something like pietism that maybe is a movement in history at certain times that we would think of, there's expressions of that that come out in all kinds of different ways. And so definitions of things get kind of messy after a while. But the overall idea comes through pretty well. So let's look at, what, first of all, the word pious simply means devoted or dutiful so it's a good thing it speaks about someone that is is devout the equivalent greek word is used in a positive way in the new testament uh, over and over for example when paul speaks of the man that god sent to him when he had the damascus road experience and he was blinded and the lord jesus was revealed to him he told him you know to go into go on into damascus and when he got there, there was this man named Ananias. And listen how Paul describes him when he recounts about what happened at that time. In Acts 22, 12, he says, Then a certain man, Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me and he stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. Notice what it says, a devout man according to the law. That's the same idea as a pious man. It, would, it could be translated pious. So here's a, a pious man, a good kind of piety, a devoted man. In 2 Peter 2.9, the word is translated by the word godly. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. The devout, the people that are devoted to the Lord, that are committed, the pious people. Sometimes we use the word in a negative way to speak of someone that has a kind of an artificial, overwrought kind of a, a religiosity or morality. You know, he, he's so pious that he doesn't even want to talk to unclean people like us. You know, we say something like that. Well, that guy's so pious. You know, that somebody that's kind of got an artificial show of piety. But as it's used here, when we talk about piety versus pietism, piety is the positive side of it. Someone that is devoted to the triune God and to his service. If we're not devoted to him, if we're not godly, if we're not pious in that way, it demonstrates that we may indeed not have true faith, however much we may claim that we believe. As James says, faith without works is dead. The scriptures teach us that the ungodly or the impious will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. In 1 Peter 4, 8, it says, Now if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly or the impious and the sinner appear? And 2 Peter 3, 7 says, But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of what kind of people? Ungodly men. Okay, so people that are impious. So again, it's important to be pious. Now, pietism, used in contrast with piety in this topic, refers to the pursuit of godliness 
when it has become twisted and distorted, where efforts to be pious have become somewhat detached from the gospel and from God's word. In some cases, the pietists actually pit doctrinal fidelity against piety, as if if you are diligent in doctrine and in the things that you believe, then you're ungodly. Like that's a distortion. That there, it's pietism where, oh, I don't own I any doctrine. I'm just going to love God. See, that, that kind of thing is what I'm talking about. There was a movement in Germany that was called pietism in the 17th century that was a reaction against the Lutheran church that was established there when the Lutheran church had become, admittedly, you know, somewhat stale. And uh, you might say that they had fallen into a kind of a dead orthodoxy. Now, when that happens, it didn't mean that there was no one there that was a true Christian, but there were a lot of people that were just going through the rituals and worship, and they weren't really, they weren't, they, they weren't pi- pious in the, in the right way. They weren't devout. The, the church had a form of godliness, and went through the motions of biblical worship, but the hearts of some of the people were far away from God. This is a condition that happens in the church. Jesus put it in Matthew 15, 8 like this. He he was actually quoting Isaiah. He said, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So they do all the worship stuff outwardly, but they're not really near to me. So it's a good thing when there's a condition like that, when the church has become stale like that, to pursue piety and godliness. But pietism speaks of a focus on piety that takes a life of its own, you might say, and then becomes detached from Christ and from the truth. As we shall see, it can take on many different forms. The problem is, it is a form of godliness that's not shaped by the Holy Scriptures, by the Word of God. As Wilhelmus Abrackel, I'll just call him Abrackel, that's his last name, um, a Dutch theologian, he wrote in the uh, 1700, he wrote this in about 1700, put it, they deviate to, quote, a natural and spiritless religion under the guise of spirituality. So they may talk about the Holy Spirit a whole lot, but it's actually devoid of the actual Holy Spirit. He describes pietists as those who comprehend, say, and do everything according to their natural intellect, fantasy, and imagination, doing so without the Spirit. And I think he really expresses it in a good way when he goes on to say that they do not make use of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that a helpful thing? Don't make use of Jesus. In other words, I'm, I'm a devoted, godly person. And oh yeah, Jesus is over there. I'm not relying on him. I'm relying on my own methods and ways of, of being all spiritual. You know, I'm doing all these spiritual things that aren't really spiritual. So he says, they do not make use of the Lord Jesus, that is, as a ransom and righteousness unto justification and peace, as being the only way of approach to God and unto true and genuine sanctification. Those, however, who are truly godly, regenerate, and who truly believe live by faith and not by sight. In all things, they make use of the Lord Jesus. There it is again. They make use of the Lord Jesus. They come to him. They come to the Father by Him, accustom themselves to behold God in the face of Jesus Christ, do everything in the presence of God, and walk before God's countenance in humility, fear, love, and obedience. These are the old paths. From this you can observe that the difference between the mystics and the truly godly is as the difference between imagination and truth, between being natural and without the Spirit and being led by the Spirit, between worldly and heavenly, between seeking an unknown God and serving the true God, 
and between being engaged without and contrary to the Holy Scriptures, dabbling with invisible things, and living according to the written Word of God. A truly godly person remains humble and serves God in spirit and truth, and is thus kept from temptation and entertaining high-minded and fabricated imaginations. I thought that was very helpful. This kind of pietism is very common today, and it appears in many different forms. If you read some of the Christian books that are on the bestseller list, you'll find that many of them are about spirituality that is not actually rooted in the scriptures or the teachings of our Lord or in dependency upon Him. They often deny certain aspects even of the historic Christian faith as revealed in the scripture and distance themselves from the church that was instituted by Jesus Christ. They're trying to be spiritual and pious apart from the things that Christ appointed and instituted, the means of grace and the church itself. They tell you how to be spiritual apart from the word of God or in ways that misuse the Word of God. So they may quote Scripture, but they misuse the Word of God, and it's not according to a, a, a confessional, biblical understanding of the whole Scriptures. They're pulling Scripture out of context and, and that sort of thing. So they're really not relying on Christ. What are some of the kinds of things that you might run into? Well, you might have instruction about prayer. I remember seeing a book about this a number of years ago when I was a fairly young believer. And uh, the instruction of prayer was about how to listen to God in prayer. So it was teaching you to kind of like go and pray and, and listen to God. Now, there's a sense in which when you're praying, of course, you can meditate on the word of God. And often God will even bring things to your mind as you're praying. That sort of thing as the Holy Spirit works in you. But this was about kind of getting information from God apart from God's word was what this book was, was advocating. Or you might be given... Uh, 20 ways to be a better husband or wife or 12 steps to recover from addiction or something like that. And these things don't, don't move you to Christ. They move you to something else away from the Word of God. You might be taught that doctrine should not be pursued because, after all, it divides. And it does. Jesus said it did. He said it would set a man at variance with those of his own household. It does. When you believe the truth and somebody else doesn't, it makes, makes a kind of a division, doesn't it? And so people say, oh, doctrine divides. Let's just get rid of all the doctrine and we'll just, we'll just love Jesus. And well, well, that's not, that's piety. That, that's pietism. That's not true piety. You might be taught to use music or, or so-called tongue speaking to move you into a spiritual frame of mind and, and get you close to God. Or you might be given guidelines for godly living that call for abstaining from certain foods. That's a very common thing in history or keeping religious festivals that God has never really appointed in His Word. It can be the traditional embellishments such as bowing before images of the saints or pictures of them or rituals that God did not appoint. And people will, you know, oh, you know, she is so spiritual. You know, she says her, her uh, rosary every day or, or, or whatever kind of thing it might be. Or it may be a distorted, unscriptural emphasis on the sacraments. Or it can be reading the Bible in a mystical way rather than a straightforward way. I remember I, I heard a whole sermon one time about how we should count our Bibles. And the guy was talking about how the numerology and how the numbers are used. And, you could, and he was doing it with verses which aren't even inspired, the verse numbers. Like, you know, all of the 316s are like John 316, and they talk about the love of God or something. You know, it was just, it was just crazy. And it, he had this whole spirituality that was not, though it claimed to be from the Bible, it was not from the Bible at all. So in short, you're given some form of godliness that is not rooted in Scripture. Now I want to look at how to become godly and truly pious instead of pietistic. We can easily be deceived into thinking we're godly because we talk about God, because we think about God, and we live for God, even though, in fact, we are far from God. You meet lots of people today, do you not, that say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm really a very spiritual person. And then when you talk to them, it has nothing to do 
with the triune God in his revealed word. Yeah, you're spiritual. What do you mean? Oh, I connect with the dirt or, you know, whatever it is. They've got some kind of, I, I'm, I'm with the planets or, or, or some kind of something that goes on. That's, that's not godliness. And it's not spiritual. Unless, you, you, unless it is the Holy Spirit, spirituality is idolatry that actually moves us away from God. So how can we be truly pious and not pietistic? Well, the only way to be truly pious or godly is by hearing God's word with faith, which leads us to Jesus Christ as he is revealed in the gospel. It teaches us to rely on Jesus Christ for our walk with God every day. For our first scripture reading that <laughs> I ha- is coming late in the sermon, isn't it? Uh, I should have told you that I wasn't going to have the scripture reading right at the beginning. But uh, it's from Galatians 3, 1 through 6. I waited until now to read it. Um, here, Paul is dealing with those who profess faith in Jesus Christ. They heard the good news of the gospel when it was preached, and they trusted in him. And they received forgiveness of sins and were reconciled to God. But then uh, they, they, came, they, they did not continue in that. Understand, you know, we're, we're guilty and we're condemned because of our sin. But the gospel teaches us that Jesus came to save us. And true godliness or piety with faith in G- Jesus Christ does, continues in Christ. It doesn't say, okay, now I'm a Christian so now I can put Christ over on the side and I can pursue, pursue spirituality in all these other ways. That's what the Galatians were doing in a sense. Listen now as I read it to you from Galatians 3, 1 through 6. He says, O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? So did your piety, did your godliness, did you receive the Holy Spirit by hearing the gospel and believing? Or was it by doing rituals of the Old Testament, which is what they were advocating? He says, are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh, by those ordinances that had to do with the with the body that were they were appointed by God and God used them to to work in his people in the time that they were to be used but not after Christ came he says have you suffered so many things in vain if indeed it was in vain therefore he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness So as you can see, what that says is that true spirituality begins by hearing God's word with faith and it continues in the same way. We do not obtain the spirit by turning away from the teaching of God's word to look within our own hearts, within our own imaginations, emotions or desires or by turning to traditions or beautiful ceremonies or innovations or whatever it might be. We are to continue in the Word of God. New Testament is central to New Testament is the teaching and preaching of God's Word. It is hearing with faith. And people say, well, it's just one verse in Galatians that you're you're showing us. No, this permeates the Bible. Whenever Paul writes to people, he says, I thank God for what? that you receive the word of God when it came to you so that you left idols to serve the living God or, or whatever. Over and over he says, you receive the word, you heard the gospel, you believe the gospel, you trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he prays that they will continue on to grow in the word of God as it is revealed. To, to many people, this may not seem like a spiritual thing at all. Spiritual stuff has to be kind of like not something that from the word of God, it has to be something that you kind of just have over here in some kind of a, a, an other dimension somewhere. The scriptures teach us about prayer and the sacraments, and they set before us the commandments of God and how God is to be worshipped. We do not find these from some other source. 
but we find them in the Scripture. And true communion with God is as what He has revealed in the Bible. So why is it that sometimes the church, when the Word is emphasized so strongly all through the pages of Scripture, people will take the sacraments. And they'll set the sacraments up and elevate them. This is the central thing right here. Baptism and the Lord's Supper. Baptism and the Lord's Supper are important, but clearly the central thing is the Word of God as it is proclaimed to us. Pietism moves away from the faith that was once delivered to the saints, the historic Christian faith revealed in Scripture, to something else. It adds rules or rituals or emphases or techniques or commitments that steer people away from what God actually says in His Word. Sometimes we have to back up and we have to look at the big picture, what is emphasized in the Word, because that's very important. We want to have a right emphasis of things. It's one of the things I've mentioned before that is a, a very important aspect of singing the scriptures, the psalms, rather than other songs. Because when you write your own songs, what do you not talk about? You don't talk about judgment very much. In the psalms, there's a balance of God's holiness, His wrath, His judgment, along with His mercy and grace. And, truth. and you don't really understand mercy and grace if there's not a holy God who judges. You take that away and then mercy and grace doesn't mean anything. It's vapid. It's empty. And so you see, we need, to, we need to see how does the scripture, what is the focus, what is emphasized? You, you seek some kind of feeling, some kind of experience, some kind of activity, some kind of ritual or something like that, that that moves you away from the emphasis of God's word. We're to continue then by hearing with faith. That's how we began and that's how we're to go on to the end. Going on by hearing with faith, this is a difficult thing for God's people. All through history, people have moved away from that, and they've gone to their own innovations and traditions and whatever. But it is so emphasized in Scripture, and I've been, I told you this, I asserted that, but I actually want to show you that today. And you know, I'm not even going to hit nearly everything where the Bible says this, but that it is the Word of God that is the key thing, the hearing with faith, as it was described in Galatians. So let's take a look here at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 2. Uh, chapter 1 especially, I'll look at, it uh, goes on into chapter 2. I'm not going to go into all of it, but in 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 25, Paul tells us that we are delivered from our sin to know and live for God. How? We... We're delivered from our sin by believing the word that is preached to us. Okay, not our own wisdom that comes from in here, but God's word that comes from him and in the Holy Scriptures. 118, he says, for the message of the cross is foolishness, according to human wisdom, to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved is the power of God. Verse 19 for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. All this stuff that people make up. He says, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Through what? The foolishness of the message preached. What the world thinks is stupid. It's what God uses to save, His Word. Well, it can't be that. It has to be something else. It has to be some of these things that we're doing over here or over there. No, it's the foolishness of preaching, the message that is preached to, those, to save those who believe. For the Jews request a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Greeks' foolishness. What did the Greeks do in the early church? They came up with all this philosophy, and they tried to wed their philosophy with the teaching of Scripture. And they ended up saying that Jesus couldn't really be God or, or very, all kinds of different errors that came out instead of receiving what was actually stated plainly in the Scriptures. He says, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Everyone wants to rely on their own resources, their own wisdom, 
their own heart, their own feelings. Different people have different ways. Sometimes it's their intellect. Sometimes it's their feelings. Whatever it is that's going to trump whatever the Word of God says. Like, that's going to take precedence over me. I don't feel that. Or that doesn't make sense to me. Well, you can say that, but you should say it in a humble way. You need to feel it, or you need to, if it's from the Word of God. Paul says that in Christ, he, it's, it's through the preaching of the Word. Now, going on to another passage, Romans 10. Here the apostle quotes from Deuteronomy 30 that we read earlier in the service, and it tells us how faith that saves comes to us. So what does he say? He begins by explaining how the Jews are ignorant of God's way of righteousness because, what, they did not believe God's word when the gospel was preached to them. Romans 10, 1 through 4, he says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved, for I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God. See, there was some pietism there, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, so they were interested in righteousness, they were trying to, to be righteous and devout and godly, seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Well, what is the righteousness of God? He says, for Christ is the end of the, the law for righteousness for everyone who believe. The righteousness of God is Christ. How do we know that? How do we connect with that? You reach the goal of salvation and attain to righteousness when you believe what the word says about him. You're not to speculate about who will get to God, but you're to simply believe the word that has been revealed. Like I said this morning, you lean on Christ. That's it. You look to him and say, Lord, I can't save myself. You've made that plain in your word. So you save me. Like you have to do the saving. You come to him. Moses told us what God requires of us to be saved. But the gospel tells us of the one who did what was required and calls us to trust in him. Moses said, this is what God requires for salvation. Jesus Christ came and did what was required. And the good news tells us that Jesus did what was required. So we need to trust in him and then we will be saved. That's how it works. Romans 10, 5. For Moses writes about the righteousness, which is of the law. The man who does these things shall live by them. You've got to do all this stuff. You've got to pay this penalty for your sins. You've got to, you know, all of this has to be done, something that people cannot do on their own. But the righteousness of faith, trusting in someone else, speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who will ascend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? Okay, so is, do you have to go somewhere to get to the word? Do you have to go into some kind of mystical trance or go into some other place? No, he says, the word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. You see? That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him, on him, will not be put to shame. So what is it again? Hearing with faith. See, this is an emphasis, isn't it? It's receiving the word in faith by trusting in the Savior. Well, we've been in Hebrews lately. What does Hebrews say about this? It teaches the same thing. How does Hebrews begin? God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, and of course their words were put into Scripture, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he made the worlds. God now speaks, makes himself known through Christ. So I said before, Moses and the law told us what was required. Christ came and did what was required, and we proclaim him as the way of salvation. Hebrews goes on to explain that he is revealed through the word of the apostles that God sent to us. So how do, we know, how do we know about Christ? It's through the word of the apostles. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For the word spoken through angels proves steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward. If that was so in the Old Testament, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? which at first began to be spoken by the Lord 
and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his will. So the, how do we learn of Christ? The apostles told us about him. How do we have access to what the apostles said? It's recorded for us in the word of God, in the Holy Scripture. It's by hearing and believing what is the apostles and prophets of the New Testament said of Jesus Christ. John begins his gospel by telling us that Christ is the word revealed to us. He is the word, uh, the, he is salvation in a sense that has come to us from heaven. In his first epistle, John specifies that he and his fellow apostles proclaim Christ to us so that we can have fellowship with God. And they write so that we can have fellowship with God. In 1 John 1, 1 through 3, he says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled, concerning the word of life. What's he talking about? We saw the word of God. We saw Christ incarnate. We were able to hear him, to see him, to touch him. He was here among us. He says the life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. Here's the key. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And then he says we write these things to you. In Timothy, Paul tells us that the very function of the church is to uphold the truth to the world. That we're the pillar and the ground of the truth. When he writes to Timothy, who is at Ephesus at the time, he says to him in 1 Timothy 1.3, Charge some that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which cause disputes rather than godly edification, which is in faith. Okay, so what was going on? This is how he opens the Timothy. What was going on there at Ephesus? These guys were doing something with genealogies. I have no idea what they were doing. They were taking genealogies and they were coming up with some kind of godliness. And there's people written about maybe what they did. But they're, they're trying to have some kind of form of godliness over here rather than the straightforward ministry of the word which is what is needed. So he says, uh, charge them not to do this, which cause disputes rather than godly edification, which is of faith. So uh, they were using the word in the wrong way, doing weird things with genealogies instead of proclaiming the truth. Not acceptable to twist the word like that. Now, going through 1 Timothy, you get to chapter 3, and Paul explains the purpose of the church is to uphold the truth about the way of godliness that God has revealed in His Son. 1 Timothy 3.14 These things I write to you. So again, he's stating his overall purpose. These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly, but if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God. What does he say to do? Make sure that you spend lots of time bowing to images of the saints. Make sure that you set up little, little um, stations of the cross around the church. Make sure that you light candles and hold them up. Make sure that you have music that will move everyone. What does he say? He doesn't say that. He says, this is how you conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. He warns that there will be some who will come along and just make up their own way of godliness. Pietism instead of piety. 1 Timothy 4, 1. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. The church is the pillar and ground of the truth. The word revealed, it upholds the word. It doesn't bring doctrines of deceiving spirits and, and demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. What are some of the things they do to make people spiritual? Forbidding to marry 
and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Is this something that's common? It is. He addresses similar problems to the Colossians, the Galatians, the Romans, and the Corinthians. For example, after setting forth the glory and sufficiency of Christ as revealed in the gospel, he tells the Colossians to not allow anyone to cheat them by setting forth another path to God other than faith in the sufficiency of Jesus Christ. In Colossians 3.16, he says, Let no one judge you in food or in drink, or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, he says, these are shadows of things to come, but this substance is of Christ. Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worshiping of angels. Oh, I got close to God. I, was, I met with Michael or, you know, one of the angels or, you know, they, they bring up. No, 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 no. He says, that's not this false humility, worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up in his fleshly mind and not holding fast the head. That's Christ, of course from whom all the body nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments grows with the increase that is from God. Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourself to regulations, do not touch, do not taste, do not handle? If you don't eat this food, you'll be more holy. You'll be closer to God. You know, whatever. It's, which all concern things which perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrines of men. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility, and neglect to the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. And in Galatians, you have things like holy days and circumcision that are talked about, and Romans, holy days that God did not appoint. There's, this is just all through Scripture. We have the teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ also about this matter concerning the way of godliness. And clearly, hearing and believing trusting in him as he is revealed in the gospel. He gives us parables like the parable of the sower about receiving and going on in the word or not. He preaches the gospel and tells us to repent and believe because the kingdom of, of God is at hand, Mark 1.15, thus calling us to godliness by trusting in him as the one who has come to save us. He calls us to believe in him that we might have everlasting life and to continue in him that we might be saved. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Whoever believes the truth that is revealed in the gospel. He tells us that he is the way, the truth, and the life and that no one comes to the Father but by him. He says that those who believe in him, John 8, 31, if you abide in my word, so he's talking about continuing now, you are my disciples indeed and you shall know the truth. That's what you need to know. And the truth will set you free. He prays in John 17, 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. He tells us to go into all the world and do what? Preach the gospel. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. When we come to other writings, again and again, it is hearing the word of faith that is called for. We have James who says, Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls and be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. In 2 Timothy, Paul tells Timothy that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation. We have Jude who tells us in Jude 1.3, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. What's the faith that was delivered to the saints? The body of truth to be believed. The things believed. That's when we say the faith delivered to the saints. He's talking about the body of truth that was given to us to believe in Scripture. We have Peter who says, 1 Peter 1, 23 through 2, 2. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever, because all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man is the flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now, this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy and all evil speaking as newborn babes, 
Desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. So there he goes again and again and again. Uh, we see this in scripture. We are definitely called to godliness, to piety. We are to pursue it. 1 Timothy 4, 7 tells us that we're to discipline ourselves for godliness or exercise ourselves for godliness. But we dare not seek piety apart from Christ and as he is revealed in the word. 1 Timothy 6, 3 says, If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, um, uh, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such, withdraw yourself. When we look beyond the word of God and the pursuit of piety, we end up destroying rather than increasing true piety following our own reason, heart, imagination, or emotions rather than God's word will lead to error. Following the traditions of men, ancient traditions, or the modern innovations of man will distort, distract us from Jesus Christ. We grow in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God when we continue in God's holy word. Having begun by hearing with faith, we're to continue by hearing with faith. Pietism is godliness according to our own terms, but true godliness comes from continuing in the word of truth. Please stand and let's pray. Oh Lord God, we need your help. We truly do need your help, Lord, because we are restless and we do not content ourselves with continuing in the word of God. We want to go somewhere else. We want to find some kind of godliness by our own means. It's interesting that we did sing Psalm 119x today that talks about your ordinances and about how we want them to be our help. And we pray, Lord, that we would rely on the things that you have given us to be godly and the central thing that you have given us which is the word of God. We think about our uh, confession and catechisms and stuff that, that teach us that you know, the means of grace, the word, sacraments, and prayer, but especially the preaching of the word. It's especially something that you have appointed. And it's very clear, as we saw in the scripture today, that that is the thing that you have highlighted as the primary means by which we hear and believe. And we pray, Father, that we would continue in your word, that we would not depart from it. We know, Lord, that there are temptations all around us to go off this way or off that way. And they can make us feel warm or they can make us feel fuzzy or they can make us feel smart or whatever it might be. But, Father, we pray that we would come to your holy scriptures and we would humble ourselves under the mighty word of God. And that we would bow down, Lord, because the word incarnate is Jesus Christ. He is the one that is presented to us in the pages of Holy Scripture. And we pray that we would bow before our Lord Jesus and we would walk with him. Oh, Lord, help us. Help us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I didn't spend a lot of blessing of the gospel Receive the blessing of our God. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began, but now made manifest, and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations, according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith, to God alone wise, be glory through Jesus Christ forever. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.